the four R-ing methodology? You know, we had an accreditation team come from schools all around um, the Northwest region, principals, teachers, and that was one thing that they said was just a stroke of genius. They said the 4R methodology, if you can really do that well at your school, produces so many beautiful fruits, they could see it themselves as professional educators. Okay, anything else that struck a chord with you this morning? Principles or practices? Please. Uh-huh. Okay. You four are Genesis chapter one, verse one. Yes. Well, wonderful. Thank you. That's it is so applicable. Well, let's go ahead and begin with our next segment, which is the principal approach in theater which is such an aesthetic subject, aesthetic subject, as opposed to the opposite, which is anesthetic, <laughs> putting you to sleep, right? Pathetic is another opposite, right? Without further ado, our wonderful, absolutely outstanding, colorful, energetic department, drama department director and stressed out drama department director, Joanne Perry and some of our drama students. Let's give her a big round of applause. Lights. Camera, we're good to go, Mr. Hancock. Good to go. And action. This one. Have you ever laughed? I mean, really laughed. I mean, laughed till it hurt and you thought you would burst into then you have a story to tell. Have you ever cried? I mean, really cried. I mean, cried till your eyes were red cause your heart's so blue. Then you have a story to tell. Each life is a story to tell. It's as wide as a river, it's as deep as a well. Each time there's a story to tell, there is joy and confusion, there is heaven and hell. And you have a story to tell. You tell me your story, I'll tell you mine. Together we'll laugh and together we'll cry. We'll both have grown stronger, hold on that much longer, just knowing that we're not alone. That's the way with a story when it's told. When you listen, my life is a story to tell. It's as wide as a river, it's as deep as a well. My life is a story to tell. There is joy confusion there is heaven and hell and I have a story to tell thank you
theater, theater is stories. It's a story that teaches you about life. It teaches you about yourself. The characters in, the, in theater, they go through a journey. Every really good theater, you go on a journey with the characters. You, you, you struggle with them through their struggles. But it's not just any story. It's a story with drama. So really fast, I'm going to do drama 101. OK, there's three words that everyone learns in a drama class that every beginning drama class, everybody knows these words. The first one is obstacle. And I'm going to use my notes, because that way I won't blabber on and run out of time. So uh, objective. Obstacle was the second one. Objective. Every character has something they want. So let's take, let's take The Wizard of Oz, because that was the show we did last fall. What does Dorothy want? She wants to, she wants to, she wants to belong. She wants to matter. That's the overall arc of her objective. Each scene, each scene has their own objectives. Um, some of the objectives are to get to Oz, to wake up from the poppies, to kill a witch. So that's that's objective. The second one is obstacles. On Fiddler on the Roof, we're going to talk about that. So Tevia, what does he want? What is his, his objective? He wants to be contented in life and, and do God's will, but he has all these obstacles. His horse breaks a leg. His daughters want to marry men he doesn't approve of. There are Russian pogroms happening. OK, so those are the obstacles. The third word is tactics. And these tactics get you what you want help you overcome the obstacles to get your objective. And if one tactic doesn't work, you, you try another one. And each scene has a tactic, tactic more than one tactic, perhaps, in each scene. Um, a classic example, again, from Fiddler on the Roof, Tevia. He needs to convince Golda, his wife, that Zeitel should marry Mottel. Oh, that's, that's the big obstacle in that scene. So how does he do it? What tactic is he going to use? Oh, he has a dream. That's a huge tactic. So that was, that was theater. That was drama 101. Um, sorry, I have to do this with holding the microphone. OK, so when I first got this assignment, I thought, well, I'm going to Google and see what comes up. So I Googled theater and Christians. And this was the top hit. I was astounded. Number one, there are four things listed. Number one, to attend the theater is a sinful waste of time. <laughs> yeah. Theatrical entertainments are not merely unprofitable, not merely a sinful waste of time, but they also directly intend to dissipate the mind and destroy all taste for serious and spiritual employments. OK, the third one. The theater is now, and ever has been, a school of vice and profligacy. <laughs> this is the last one. There's, the, there's a whole article about it. These are just the, some bullet points. Those who go to the theater um, not only contribute to the support of an impious and harmful amusement, but also contribute to the encouragement, oh my gosh, and support of a set of licentious play actors. Ouch. Ooh, that's me. OK. Oh, wait, I want to keep this open. OK, certainly, certainly that was true. When theater began, you know, back with the Greeks, it was pretty bad. Uh, the, the paganism that was found in the theater, it was. It was really bad. It was so bad that the leaders of, of the, the cities, um, they wanted to suppress it, but they couldn't because it was so popular with the people. So what happens? Oh, the church thinks, we're going to do that. It's kind of like today, you know? You have the internet and all these bad things, and so the church says, OK, we're going to use that to our advantage. And now they're embracing technology like, I, like never before. So the church back in the day, they decide, we're going to teach about Christ through plays. We're going to put on passion plays. We're going to do morality plays. All this happened. So yeah, theater is bad. And yeah, theater is the best thing on the planet because it can teach you things that you will never learn any other way. Um, OK, to keep on with my time here, I'm going to read. OK. Oh. Oh, my gosh. I need this again. OK, so let's hear what Brigham Young has to say about theater. Oh, I can't believe I did that. I just deleted it. OK. <laughs> what was it? OK, there were two. Something about, oh, I can't believe I did that. OK. Brigham Young said, if I were on a, an island with cannibals, I would promptly build a theater, something like that. 
Uh, it was almost word for word, something like that. He used the word cannibals, and he did say promptly and build a theater. And the other thing that Brigham Young said, I can't believe I did that, how dramatic I am up here, was um, that in theater, it teaches us, it, you, you're able to see the choices of right and wrong, and on the stage, you're able to see what happens to people when they make those choices. It's a great way to go through those awful things that you secretly wanted to do without actually having to do them because you can see the end result. Okay. Oh, read it really loud. <laughs> How dramatic you are. It's a dramatic pause. I should straightway build a theater. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on because my, my task was actually... Um, the topic was identifying principles that reveal God in theater. Okay, I have 15 minutes, I can do this. Uh, so I chose a few of the principles, and I have some helpers here. So the first one is God's principle of individuality. Part of it says, each person is a unique creation of God designed to express the nature of Christ individually in society. Okay, come on up, Daniel. Okay, so the last play that we did here was The Merchant of Venice. And for those of you who don't know, we've got Shylock the Jew, and he's the villain of the whole thing. Nobody likes him because he's evil. And, and pretty much when you see him in the play, you agree, yeah, he's an evil man. And then this moment happens in the play where all of a sudden my eyes went, Wow, wow, everything changed because I saw who he really was. People were always saying, in Venice, people didn't like Jews. The anti-Semitism was, was rampant back at that time. And, and nobody liked the Jews. They were second-class citizens because they were different. They had different culture. They wore different clothes. Well, he's not. Um, and they, they spoke a different language. Everything was different about them. And people did not like them because they weren't like them. That's not God's principle of individuality. So then he says this. To bait fish, if it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me, mocked my gains, scorned my nation. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. Had not a Jew eyes. Had not a Jew hands, senses, affections, passions. Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warm and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? And if you tickle us, do we not laugh? And if you wrong us, shall we not have revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferings be by Christian example? Why, revenge. The villain you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Thank you. I love those kids. Okay, uh, um, this is eighth grade, by the way. Well, they're ninth grade now. Um, so when I heard that moment in that play, I thought, yeah. They are like us. People who think we're different, they sh everyone should be like us. No, no, we're, we're all different. Let's celebrate that. And that, that moment in the play opened up my eyes. Okay, cl come on up, Clara. Okay, so Portia, she's the lead girl in the play, and uh, Bassanio falls in love with Portia. She's rich, and he doesn't have enough money to woo her, so he goes to his friend Antonio and says, can I borrow some money? He says, well, yeah, I don't have any right now because all my goods are out on the, the ocean with my boats. But, but I have good credit, so let's go to Shylock the money lender and let's just borrow the money. And so they go there and, they, and Shylock says, yeah, I'll lend you the money. And if you don't pay me back by this certain day, I'm gonna write up this bond. If you don't pay me back, I will exact a pound of your fair flesh to be cut closest to the heart. And he says, okay, I'll do it because I'm good. My credit's really good. So of course there's the sea wreck, uh, uh, storms and all of his boats crash and he has no money and it, the bond comes it comes time to, to, to cash in on the bond. And um, Portia learns about all this, and she is a smart cookie, and she discovers there's a loophole in the law. So she disguises herself as a young, learned doctor, and she comes to the trial where Shylock is going to 
cut out the pound of flesh from Antonio's heart. And the first thing she does is she applies to his mercy. She said, well, you're going to be merciful, aren't you? And he says, no, no, because I'm all about justice. And, and this is what the law says. It's the law. That is what reigns supreme is the law. I will show no mercy because the law. And then she says this. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows a force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty. Wherein does sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods. When mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer that teach us to render the deeds of mercy. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was Daniel Lee and Clara Cook, who are now ninth graders, no longer eighth graders. Wasn't that beautiful? To hear mercy described like that, I could have just said the, the play, or it, in real life, you could have said, but mercy's important. You really need to have mercy. Or you could say it like that, and you can remember it like that. And I will always remember, every time I hear the word mercy now, I think mercy is not strained. It falls from heaven like the gentle rain. I think those things, that's powerful, the things that you can learn through theater, through really, really good, good theater. Um, Let's see. OK, this next one, really fast. OK, so I need Blaine, Julie, and Corinne to come on up. They're, oh, you know what? I told, that was the Christian, I didn't read it. Anyway, OK, the next thing is the fifth one, the Christian form of government. I don't have my glasses on, so that's why it's hard. I look ridiculous. Proper government requires a balance of internal power and its external form as seen in the separation of powers that its dual form and its dual form with checks and balances. So come on up, you guys. Come on up, 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 up. OK, so in theater, it, ta it talked about balance and checks and balances. In theater, you always have to have the stage balanced. And you can't have certain, you just have to balance everything. So we do this game in, in theater. And I had the kids that I wanted to come do it. But they were like at girls camp and out of town. So they couldn't. So I asked these teachers. They have no idea what they're doing. OK, so you're going to be doing an improv. They do have no idea what they're doing. It's an improv. One of you is a doctor, one of you is a patient, and one of you is a nurse. Decide who you're going to do it. <laughs> nurse. OK. OK. Their, their, uh, their task is one of them has to be standing, one of them is squatting, one of them is sitting. OK? That's what you have to do. It's all got to be balanced. And let's say after five seconds, the person who is you know, squatting decides to stand, then somebody else has to squat. And we'll just see what happens. And there's a chair. OK, so here we go. We'll see what happens.
It's good. You guys are great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. My kids love that one. Okay, Greg, I'm going to shut this one off, and I'm going to turn this one on, and we'll take it from there. Testing. Here we go. Okay, the next, the last principle I'm going to talk about is the fourth one. Conscience is the most sacred of all properties. So the last line says, each individual governs his life through the voluntary consent to do right or wrong. So voluntary consent to do right or wrong. Um, let me get ordered here. I'm going to use my notes so I don't babble and take other people's times. Uh, life is a choice. Um, and there's magic, there's magic when you get to see on the stage a, a whole person's life because you can see the choices that they make and where it leads to, just like Brigham Young talked with that quote that I didn't have for you. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes people choose wrong and sometimes in the audience we're thinking maybe we want to make that same choice. But then we can see, we can see it played out. Sometimes people choose right but it doesn't feel like it's the right choice because it didn't work out the way the way it should and you know you always hear oh you learn from this and there's there's something great that's going to come out of this but you don't feel that when you're in the middle of it but to see on stage a whole person's whole life or a chunk of a person's life while they're going through this struggle perhaps struggle that you're going through you can see why it was the right thing to follow your conscience and make that right choice so uh, in theater you get to see you get to watch characters going through some of the same things you are, and it can be life-changing to just have an example of how to get through this situation. That kind of story is the, is the one worth telling and makes the best kind of theater. So 25 years ago, my husband wrote a musical um, for me to do because I was having babies and nursing, and I just couldn't do theater anymore. So he wrote one for me, a whole one-woman show that I could just do whenever I wanted to. <laughs> It was called Polly, <laughs> and we did it for years and years and years. And um, it's the story of his great, his third great grandmother. And uh, it starts off in, in the show when she's old, she's about to die, and then it, it right from the very beginning, it goes back in time to when she's 14 years old, and it starts from there. And then you see that her whole life happened in front of you. So we're going to do the opening number from Polly. thoughtful of you folks to come visit. Most young folks would just as soon leave old folks be. They get weary of the same stories time and time again. Can't think why. I reckon they get better with every telling. I hope you'll forgive me for speaking my mind. I'm just an old woman with far too much time to think. How strange I must seem to be. I'm not so peculiar, and yet I'm remarkable. <coughs> What's so remarkable about Polly, Polly Matilda, Polly Matilda Merrill Colton? Just Polly alone will do perfectly well. If you want a remarkable story to tell, talk to Eliza. Where you should go, or to Polly, Polly Matilda. We can't all be Eliza or Snow, Smith, Young, well, whomever she's gotten herself attached to lately. <laughs> or else there's that woman, Miss Mary Graves, one of the ill fated daughter party, I'm afraid. She was remarkable, too. Having eaten a bridle, a belt, and a shoe. And of course, her fellow travelers. She was uncommon. 
common, she was of note, she was remarkable, she was a cannibal. What she'd done to stay alive, she was shunned, but she survived. That's what I'd known then what I know now. Would anything be changed if I could choose again somehow? Would I still choose the same? I was a girl from a small town. It was called Shelby, Michigan. Shelby, Michigan. But I won't be there again. <laughs> <laughs>